So we're learning Likutei Sichos, the discourse for Pesach in Volume 1. And I think we're up to Chapter 3, but we're almost there. We, we didn't finish Chapter no, 2. We in the okay. okay. So we said that from the order of the four kashas, the way it is by the Yerizal, we learned that a minhag is actually more important in terms of educating a child than different hierarchies that the parents understand, such as this is more important because it's from Torah and this is less important because it's from the sages and this is even less important because it's only a custom. But oh. in the order of the kashas, the order of the questions in the Seder, we see that the custom is more important than everything. Why? So he said, because when a child looks at what he's seeing, he doesn't understand the verbal side. What he understands, what the child understands, is the practical side. And the stranger something is, the more of an impression it leaves. So this whole thing of dipping, see I got that word right away, the whole thing of dipping and dipping twice, that stands out more than even the matzah or the maror, or the bitter herbs. Okay. He says, if the child acts, his customs, the way he behaves, is the same as his environment, his non-Jewish environment, it won't matter if he sets time to learn Torah every day, if he davens, if he prays, if he performs other commandments, we're not talking about whether it's a custom or whether it's from the Torah or not. We're talking about the impression that it leaves. And what leaves an impression? Only behavior. And the more peculiar, the more strange the behavior, the more it's not like what he's accustomed to seeing, that is what leaves the impression. That creates the sense that there's something special going on. Okay, so it gets up everyone. He sees his father drive to work and go to the other car and drive to work. Right, so he, he says. Their week. His father doesn't drive the car. He doesn't it's not good car. enough. And he walks. <coughs> that's strange, no? Okay, that's strange. That, that will leave an impression. But he says that if he dresses the same, if he in the end behaves the same, meaning, I think that the Rebbe was talking here about people who in the end they say, we use the same culture that the people around us use. It's very common in Israel. The people that are what they call the tea. So they have the same culture, basically, as people who are not. They drink and they eat and they watch the same things as people who aren't from. They don't have a different culture. To be able to have a sense... They dress differently. They dress differently. A lot of them speak Yiddish. They, they do different things. But the the dress, the way that pe- people act, the, the day-to-day life, they don't have a TV, they don't watch movies. They don't have a what? They don't have a TV. That's an old invention from the 1950s, from the previous century. They don't have cable, they don't have satellite, they don't have any of these things. So the, ch- the books are smartphone. different, the books are different, they don't have a smartphone. They don't have all these things. The moment that you don't have these things, it's, it's a lot of it is... Not just what you don't have, it's a lot of it is what you do have. And they have other things instead. So the moment that you have all these different things and it sets you apart, you have a sense as the Rebbe of what holiness means. Because holiness by definition means something that's set apart. It's so not why are there so many kids who are on so God's street? As I said, we were deprived. We didn't have a this and we didn't have a that. Right. And all the neighbors have four right. cars and right. we right. didn't even have a television. Right. Right. So first of all you have to know the numbers. The numbers are that from the the Dati world, what they call the religious, unfortunately the numbers are north north of 50% do not remain from. They don't remain religious. 
they don't remain observant. And they become, yeah, in the, the tea world, it's more than 50%. It's somewhere close, to, it's between 50 and 60, I don't remember the exact number. In the, in the Haredi world, it's less than 10%. In the ultra-Orthodox world, it's less than 10%. Those 10% are very vocal because when they leave, they come and they say, they didn't teach me math in school. They didn't teach me English. No, that's what they're angry at. Nobody taught me all these things. I, I was deprived. When you say deprived, what was I deprived of? The culture. But they don't understand that that deprivation of the culture at a young age, that's exactly what made them, what makes the rest, the 98% and 92 or 93% of the children appreciate where they are. They have a concept of what holiness means. Now, it's not that these kids don't have a concept of holiness. They do, but there were other things that trumped the sense of holiness over time. Okay, whatever. And when the person doesn't understand the foundation, which is that there's holiness to the Torah, there's holiness to the mitzvahs. I was watching Y.Y. Jacobson the other day. And he said, we don't appreciate Simcha's Torah enough. He said, imagine that you would see, imagine this, imagine this picture. You'd see the 100 senators in the American Senate proclaiming one day a year that they get up and they all dance with the Constitution. <laughs> Can you even imagine that? In, in England, they would get up the House of Lords and dance with the Magna Carta. In the Supreme Court, they would get up and when, when lawyers finish their matriculation exams and they become lawyers, the bar, whatever it is, they would get up and they would dance with the books of law. Really dance at the bar. <laughs> they dance at the bar. We don't understand how ridiculously different we are. The Jews every single year get up and for a whole day, that's all we do just dance with our book of laws is, is it just doesn't exist anywhere nothing similar to it and I mean what are we saying in the end that we're intellectual that we believe in, in thought we believe in progress we believe in, and how do we show it that we dance with the 3,300 year old book so that that is what creates the sense of holiness that's the what sets you apart that's the story of Napoleon yeah about uh, Tisha B'Av yeah, yeah. So, so he says, if that foundation doesn't exist, the foundation of understanding the concept of holiness, then everything else will be lost also. It doesn't matter how many mitzvahs the person does. The commandments won't last. He says it has a lot to do with how you build your customs. Because that is what ingrains and what leaves an impression on the child's mind, and that's what ingrains in them the concept of holiness. Chapter 3. Above and beyond the fact that we say that the customs of Israel are like Torah themselves. As it says that the minhag, the custom of Israel is Torah. Even the customs of women. Because it didn't come, no, because it didn't come from uh, 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 from an in-depth study of Torah. Those customs didn't come from there. They came from just day-to-day -day habits. But everything is so permeated with the Torah. They were saying even, even someone who in past generations didn't learn Torah, the way they acted, that becomes Torah. <coughs> because of that, you should never weigh what is more important a custom, or a chazal, or a Torah, or a Doraisa. Everything should be equal. You shouldn't weigh the, the, the path of life as a Pesach in Mishlei. Okay? Mishlei 5-6. Exactly what you're doing now. You're exactly doing that. You're exactly no. saying now the, the customs are more important. You're exactly weighing them. No, because we're not saying that they're more important than... than, than the, they're absolutely more important. We're saying we have a certain goal here. The certain goal here is to educate. When it comes to education, this is what leaves the impression. We're not saying to the child, this is more important. We're, we're saying, how should I conduct myself? What should I focus on? So that the child is impressed by what we, by what we do. I'm not saying what is 
absolutely more important. Okay. Okay. So this is the Above and beyond that, we have here the first foundation of education. The child has to know that he's different than everyone else. He needs to know that he's a Jew. And you achieve that through the customs. The, the customs stick out. The eye catches them, it sees them. It leaves an impression. And they root in the person the sense that you have chosen us from all nations. And because of that, because you chose us from all the nations, you brought us closer to your service. And that is the foundation, the true foundation of the entire Torah. <coughs> and he ties this into the idea that serving, meaning assisting, the things that are in assistance are greater than the things that are taught or the things that are learned. Meaning is that if I bring my Rebbe a cup of tea, that's greater than, they said this because they wanted to get tea, right? Because if they didn't say this, I wouldn't leave because I don't want to miss anything that the Rebbe says. Yeah, he says it's very important to bring the Rebbe tea. So it's more important than to listen yeah, to him. Chapter 4. When you educate children properly and you teach them that even the customs are Torah and they should be held in such a regard that you're willing to sacrifice your life for them. And that's exactly what happens, right? Because in a time of a persecution, even, I forgot how to say it, the black laces in the shoes you can't change. Right? What's it called? Shoes. No. There's a name for it. There's a name for it in Allah. It's a concept. Because they even those things you are required to sacrifice yourself for. If they force you to change it. Right? They say it's going to not be black laces, it's going to be white laces. Uh, so, too bad. <laughs> Then, as a result of that, when you're willing to sacrifice yourself even for a custom, then, even though you were slaves to Pharaoh in, in Egypt, God, Avaya, took you out with an outstretched arm and a powerful arm. And even now, in the present, like the days in which you came out of Egypt. Despite the double and quadruple darkness of the exile that we're in now, He will take us out of the darkness into great light. And we shall praise you with a new song, not a feminine new song, but rather a new song in the masculine. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Right? We did? Mm-hmm. About the ten, uh, the ten songs. That the tenth one is called the Shir. It's not the Shira. And we have, there's a custom on the, on the seventh day of uh, Passover at night before we read the song at the sea the next morning to recite the nine songs in the Bible. Right? There are nine songs all together. But what we said before is that even though it's Hashem awakening, he, it will give birth to a male, meaning that it will be a lasting redemption, in spite of the fact that he's the one who's awakening. And we're demanding that he awaken in a certain sense. Without exile after it, by the Mashiach. Right, but he said that in the future, even when Hashem awakens, it, 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 she gives birth to a male. That's what he's referring to here. That even though it will be Hashem who is awakening, it will be, it will lead to a male being born, meaning that it will be a lasting redemption. Okay, the next next part is unbelievable. He's quoting now from the Haggadah. He says, Right? The story was 
that the head of the Sanhedrin, the Nasi, was Ravan Shimon ben Gamliel. And he was a very, very difficult uh, individual. And he had made all kinds of decrees that were very difficult for the sages. One of these decrees was that they had to test people to find out if they wanted to enter the the base medras, they wanted to enter the academy, they had this test, not about what they knew, but about their character. And if anybody was found lacking in any way in their character, they described it as his inside is not like his outside, meaning that he doesn't really fit, he doesn't um, live up to the image he's trying to project, so he was left out of the academy, they, they wouldn't let him enter. And other things that he did, and then there was something that 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 really blew everyone's uh, uh, patience with Rabbi Yoshua. The Rabbi Yoshua didn't agree with Ravan Shimon ben Gamliel about how to calculate that month. It was the month of Tishrei, I mean it was Elul and it was Tishrei, and he figured that Yom Kippur would be on what Ravan Shimon ben Gamliel thought would be the eleventh, but Rabbi Yoshua thought the eleventh was the tenth. That, that was Yom Kippur. And so, to teach him a lesson, as it were, and to show that there's no descent, he forced him to come on the day of his Cheshbon, the day, the 11th, for, for Ravan Shimon, this was the 11th, for Yeshua, this was Yom Kippur, he forced him to come and desecrate Yom Kippur, and come before the Sanhedrin with his uh, pocketbook and, and, and every, everything. So there were a lot of things that led up to this, but eventually the other sages decided they would have a coup, and they decided to demote him. And they were debating about who to appoint instead. Eventually they all agreed upon Rabbi, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. But the only problem was that Rabbi Elazar was 18 years old. So he went to consult with his wife. And she said to him, don't take the job. Don't become the head of the Sanhedrin. Why? Because tomorrow they're going to make up with Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. And then they'll demote you back to a regular sage. You don't need this whole trip. You don't need this uh, detour. Just keep learning and everything will be fine when you're older. But he decided in the end to take it. But before he could take it, he, he said, but I don't look, I don't look the part. That was very interesting. He was, a, he was a young man, 18 years old. He had a black beard. So how can he become the sage, the, uh, the head of the Sanhedrin? So out of nowhere, it says that he grew suddenly 18 rows of white hairs inside his uh, beard. So what exactly that means? What's a row? Okay, it's a little bit difficult. But it could be that what it means, we're used to shura being a row. But by them, a shura was a column. So it could be there was 18 columns of white hair inside his long beard. In any case, he looked like he was 70 years old, but he wasn't 70 years old, right? This, is the, this was the classic um, deviation from Rabbi Shimon's decree that anybody who's not the same on the inside as on the outside shouldn't enter into the base midrash, shouldn't, shouldn't enter into the academy. But now Rabbi Lazar ben Azari is taking his place was exactly that. He, he, he only looks like he's 70 years old, but he's not. He doesn't live up to that. Lefize, I skipped over the first uh, paragraph which you just explained. Biltu muvana neemar b'emshech advarim. So if this is so, that his looking 70 years old was just an appearance. He wasn't really 70 years old. He was only 18. He just looked it. So the rest of the of his of what he's quoted as saying doesn't make any sense. Why? Because what does he say? He said, Lefib shutam shel advarim nirashat mial velo zachiti. He says. And I did not merit yet to see the ruling made such that every person should recall the exodus from Egypt every night. That was a, that's what he wanted to change. That's what he wanted the ruling to be because he felt that it wasn't enough to mention the exodus from Egypt in the morning. He said you also have to mention it at night. He says, I am not yet merited. Even though I'm like 70 years old, I have not yet merited. But, but, but that doesn't make sense. Because if you're only 18, you're not really 70 years old. So what's the problem? You're only 18. Give it some time, you know. Uh, work on it for 10 years. Uh, campaign for it. Uh, convince the other sages that this is the best thing to do, and so on. 
if you're 60, 70 in real physical years and it still hasn't happened, maybe there's, maybe there's some room to say, I didn't merit yet. But now when you're 18, uh, most people don't you know, get their stride in, 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 in legal uh, decisions until they're much older. So what's going on here? Why was he so sure that he was supposed to have been victorious in this ruling? That the ruling should have been according to him? Let's get all the way to the end of the, uh, uh, the, end of the page. Where, where did you get this from? That they should uh, rule like you? Maybe, but you're still the, not. You're the boss, man. Yeah, he's the boss, but you know, the Nasi is just one, one, one vote. There's 70 other people. But they still agree with him, but the Nasi. But they don't. And you're only 18, so what do you want? If he really would have been an, a, an elder sage, 70 years old, and he became the Nasi, the head of the academy, the head of the Sanhedrin, so it makes sense. But since he's not, so what, what's his complaint? So if it says, I'm like 70 years old, meaning he compared himself to a person who was 70 years old, and the sages say that he grew 18 columns of white hair, that's obviously, the Rebbe says, it's a mashal. It's a parable. They don't mean that he actually, suddenly his hair changed. That's not what happened. But it, something something in his demeanor, something in the way he acted, something in the way, uh, all that changed. And he looked like a person who was 70 years old. You could look at him, like uh, last night, uh, one of the boys from uh, my older son's uh, class got engaged. Uh, they were 19 now. So my wife said, oh, this, this boy, he always looked like a Saba. He always looked like a grandfather. Like from the time we've known him, we've known him since he was in kindergarten with her son. He always was like a like a grandfather. He always walked slowly. He was very composed. He, was, <laughs> he had time for everything. He wasn't in a rush for anything. So the that he got married, oh, okay, so he's a he's a grandfather anyway. So I guess something by Rabbi Lazar ben Azari, who now suddenly became the Nasi. He began. It's like the Shlomo Zayde when he was born. They called him a Zayde. They called him the grandfather. People were like that. So something happened to him. So that's what the sages mean. Eighteen columns. Why eighteen? We can talk about it. What's what's the significance of that, and so on. But the idea is that his demeanor changed. But says the Rebbe, since this is a parable that the Talmud is using, this parable has meaning. And Am Shalim Stam, they didn't just pick a parable out of their hat. We have all kinds of parables. But rather they express something in reality. So it says the fact that the sages choose to paint him as an old man, it means that spiritually he really was an old man. It's just that physically his body was 18 years old. But he's really an old man. How can that be? So the Arizal Siddur, I don't know which one they mean. It's usually Reb Shabtai. When you talk about the Arizal Siddur, it's usually Reb Shabtai. I have to check. I didn't have time to check which one it is. and They don't, they don't have footnotes here. It says that in the Arizal's uh, Siddur, it says that he had a reincarnation that was 52 years. So with the with his older self, he was actually 70 years old. He had been in the world a total of 70 years. 52 in the first incarnation, and 18 years this time. Okay. It's very interesting that last night, yesterday, my wife turned 52. Huh? Santo. And she told me something amazing. She says, "I just." I, she said, "Why was Shlomo? Why did Shlomo Amelech? Why did King Solomon have such a hard time understanding the red heifer? Right? He had he had a problem. How do you understand that something that the person who brings the purifying waters and and, and, and spreads it, he becomes, he becomes impure?" She says, "If if King Solomon would have made a pesach like us, he would know right away why it works. You don't have to work very hard. It's not very difficult." She, she, she shows me her hands. Look at me, I'm cleaning the house. Look at what I look like. 
the more you clean, the dirtier you get. So that's how it works. So I said, it's a tremendous chap. It's very simple. It's true. So I said, how, how, how did this happen? Very simple. Shlomo, King Solomon, lived till 52 years old. You just turned 52. You, you, just, you just have one day extra, more than him. That's why the, the secret of the red heifer came to you. Because <laughs> you just had, you finished the 52 years of King Solomon, now you're a day older. It's when you're 52 in a day that you understand this thing. Okay. So anyway, so he was really 70, 70 years old. 52 plus 18. Because spiritually, he was a 70-year-old man. Even though in this, in this incarnation he's only 18 right now. But he should have merited, meaning he was a sage also in the previous incarnation, with some elder sage, and he wasn't able to convince them even in the previous uh, incarnation. Now he also, he, he hasn't had a chance yet. He's only in teeth. So that's why he's, he's, he, 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 uh, he has this question, uh, or not question, but this uh, surprise that he still hasn't been able to convince them of this uh, ruling that you should also mention the exodus from Egypt at night and not just during the day. Okay. So he says that because this spiritual reality was not just that he had been 52 years in some whatever, he wasn't in Timbuktu for 52 years in this previous incarnation. He was a sage and he was learning Torah. And so these 52 years do join the 18 that he has now. And so, the reality was that in some way his demeanor changed and suddenly he looked old. Okay? And even, where did he look old? He even looked old in his beard somehow. It's not that it really turned into white, but it looked different. There was something different about it now. So he says that happens because Torah affects the world, the physical world. And as we say from the Yerushalmi, that the moment that we make a ruling in some direction, that affects reality, changes reality. What's, what are the examples? And we'll go into the now, but you know what the examples are. But let's, let's see, what, what did he learn from this? You have to go? You have, you have plenty of time. He said it's at 45. Five more minutes. No, okay, so we're up to chapter 6. What he does with this is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So we'll have to uh, wait till tomorrow to find out. If you come. I will come, God willing. 7.30. What? When and where do you want to go? 7.30. You want to learn after? You want to learn at 9? That's fine also. What? How are you going? Okay. Okay. So we will learn tomorrow at uh, resume tomorrow at seven thirty in the morning. Okay. In the afternoon, it's uh, good.